So when you started studying imagery, there really wasn't much research in that domain yet, was there? Not, not a great, not a great deal. Uh, I had about twelve experiments in a program on imagery. Some of them were a bit more experimental than others. Uh, I was started to consolidate my cognitive position on imagery that slotted into a particular model of hypnosis, a model that was um, rather compatible with the individual differences model of Ernest Hilgard. But I went across to Martin Orman in Philadelphia, and uh, Martin, I think, was at the peak of his creativity in some great ideas about what might be behind hypnotic phenomena, uh, and in a sense that launched me into a very detailed program and hypnosis that occupied my research attention for decades. Well, some of the research was about real versus simulating subjects. Some of it was about the illogic of trance, the, the phenomenon of trance logic that Martin had been interested in. But the early stuff was about imagery and different forms of imagery. And as you said, the susceptibility to hypnosis played a role in that. What were your observations about the differences in susceptibility? Well, I, I suppose I'd have to say uh, I have never wavered from uh, a confident position that imagery and individual differences in imagery and fantasy are a very important part of hypnotic susceptibility. I confess to being a little bit surprised that when the, the die has been cast on that question, uh, then if you're a good imager, you may or may not be susceptible to hypnosis, but if you're a bad imager, I know you're not. And the curvilinear relationship between imagery and susceptibility uh, interested me enormously, uh, an enormous lot. And it alerted me to the fact that Imagery is one aspect of that individual differences that mark a susceptibility, a susceptible person. And there are many other factors, many other traits that were relevant. And of course, one gets into that and then I drifted uh, very intensely into a phenomenological approach to hypnosis. That wasn't necessarily Martin Horne's approach wasn't necessarily Phil Sutcliffe's approach or Gordon Hammer's approach, but it was the approach I found gave satisfaction to where I wanted to go in hypnotic research. So when you were exploring imagery, you were talking about something much more complicated than just the ability to generate visual images in your mind. Uh, yes, I, I was really interested mostly in my research in imagery as such into the question of how veridical an image is in relation to an actual experience. One can sense there's a relationship between that question and hypnosis, but I was intrigued by a remark of Binet and Ferre in their classical work that uh, um, they talked about the fact that there's not a lot of difference between image and delusion. And uh, I was intrigued with how much a belief in the reality of things is a component of someone who images well. My research was really exploring the nature, uh, both in process and substantive terms, of someone having vivid imagery. I was particularly interested in the correspondence between actual perception and the experience of vivid imagery. And I tried to pick that up in a number of ways. And, uh, and in a sense, once I phrase the question like that, it can very easily take me into almost simulation. I mean, say, image is as if you were perceiving. And if I describe image as as if I was perceiving, you can see my passage into being intrigued with the simulation aspects of hypnotic phenomena. So when you started doing some of the simulation research, 
what did you, what were you hoping to find? What did you expect to find? What did you find? <coughs> well, I suppose the, the simulation research was an extension of the as-if experience. So you could go back to the early philosophers on the dimensions of as-if behavior. And I guess I was influenced by Phil Sutcliffe in his distinction between credulous and skeptical. And I was always around experimenting that difference, but got into the as-if dimensions uh, of uh, uh, hypnotic phenomena. And I then developed a fairly intense preoccupation, which is reflecting my approach to psychology, my approach to hypnosis, in the methodological approaches to hypnosis. And so my first book was The Nature and Function of Imagery, but then within the hypnosis field was Methodologies of Hypnosis. And in the Methodologies of Hypnosis, eventually I drifted into doing a prolonged program of research into the phenomenology of hypnosis. And when you were doing that research and you developed the experiential analysis technique, talk about that and why the phenomenology was important. Uh, well, I, I basically, I guess at a theoretical level, was intrigued with Ronald Shaw's notion of the phenomenological reality of hypnosis. And then he developed a methodolog methodology around phenomenology but my particular interest in developing the experiential approach, which later I wrote up with Kevin McConkie, but my particular interest was sparked by one particular subject. And I was so intrigued with the behavior of the <coughs> subject, it locked me into a program of research for 13 years. Uh, I was in Martin's lab uh, investigating the differences between real and simulating behavior and that was really an analyzing a methodological approach to hypnosis. And Martin was very much interested in the difference between real and simulating behavior. And this psychiatric nurse came in and I gave him a post-hypnotic suggestion uh, that every time he heard the word experiment, his hand would reach up to his forehead, which he was a wonderful subject and he did that. And after I brought him out of hypnosis, I said, now, remember I told you every time you hear the word experiment, uh, you now no longer need to do that every time you hear the word experiment. Whenever I talked, his hand rushed to his forehead. And I said, look, I don't know what's going <coughs> on here. I think I now know. But the fact that he was so compulsive absolutely intrigued me. I woke him up out of trance and I, he said, look, I've got a problem, Dr. Sheehan. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, I'm assisting a psychiatrist, uh, working with him, and I had my hand on his papers. He mentioned the word experiment. I lifted my hand to my face. His papers flew around the room. And I was suddenly aware of this extraordinary compulsion. No matter what I said, he was still doing it. I said, what is going on here? And then I did 13 years of research to try and find it.